Welcome to the latest of our academic webinars from the Institute of Economic Affairs and the Vincent Center, University of Buckingham, with me, Sai Kamal. I'm a professor of politics and international relations at St. Mary's University in Twickenham, but I'm also the academic research director of the Institute of Economic Affairs. Now, if you'll join us for the first time, I'll tell you a bit about the IEA. We're an educational charity founded in 1955 to improve the understanding of the fundamental institutions of a free society. And we do this by analysing and explaining the role of markets in solving economic and social problems. Now, today we'll be discussing the ongoing debate about the, about the abundance or scarcity of resources and how that relates to growth in population. And specifically focusing on the infamous uh, Simon Ehrlich bet, named after the bet between Julian Simon, the economist, and Paul Ehrlich, the environmentalist, on whether commodities would be scarcer and more expensive over time. As many of you might know, Simon won the bet, but there's still a debate amongst economists and environmentalists as to whether uh, um, Julian Simon got lucky. Well, to discuss this, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Marion Tupi of the Cato Institute in Washington, DC. He's the co-author of a recent paper published in Economic Affairs titled Luck or Insight, the Simon Ehrlich Bet, Reexamined. Now, before I introduce uh, Marion, let me talk you through the format today. We are recording this format, uh, so, sorry, this webinar, and the Q&A to be uh, posted on our IEA uh, YouTube channel, IEA London. And we'll also start, we'll start with a talk from Marion and he'll have a presentation. Please feel free to submit questions during this presentation. Don't feel that you have to wait until the question and answer session starts. Now, if you prefer, uh, you can submit your questions anonymously and you can do this by selecting this option in the Q&A. Now, if you move your cursor to the bottom of the screen, you should see a chat function and a Q&A. Please submit your questions using Q&A, not chat. What we'll use a chat function for is to share any relevant links, or if you have a technical problem, we can check out whether it's your end or, or at our end. Now, after Marion is finished speaking, I'll move to the Q&A. And instead of calling you to ask your question in person, what, we, what I tend to do is I'll read out your question. So please make sure you do write your question in the Q&A. Now, if we have more questions than time allows, what's very helpful for me, and I'm going to ask for your help on this, is that you go to the Q&A function, whether or not you've asked a question, and you vote on the other questions. That allows me to select the uh, questions in a democratic way, the ones that you just think uh, merits uh, uh, to be uh, discussed and asked. Sometimes we have um, more questions than time allows, and this helps us to sort through the questions. So now to our speaker, delighted to be joined by a friend, Dr. Marion Tupi who's the editor of humanprogress.org. He's a senior fellow at the Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity at the Cato Institute in Washington, DC, and co-author of the Simon Project. He specializes in globalization and global well-being uh, and politics and economics of Europe and Southern Africa. He has a BA in international relations and classics from the University of the Witterstand, uh, Witterstand, sorry, Witterstand, I'm sorry, in Johannesburg, South Africa, and a PhD in international relations from the University of St. Andrews in the UK. He's the co-author of an upcoming book, 10 Global Trends That Every Smart Person Needs to Know, and many other trends you will find interesting. So Marion, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Really looking forward to what you have to say. Let me hand the floor over to you. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. I really appreciate it. Delighted to be on uh, uh, this uh, um, on the show, but also I'm delighted that uh, IEA has published uh, a recent paper that uh, I wrote together with my co-author um, Gail Pooley. Um, the, the paper itself, um, I uh, have decided, is, um, uh, assumes uh, quite, a little, uh, quite a lot of background uh, knowledge. And so what uh, this particular presentation is going to be about, it's going to be on the same subject um, the numbers uh, that you will see in my presentation are about uh, a year or two out, uh, but, um, uh, but it, it's the same subject, but it sort of begins at the beginning. Uh, and, and if you are intrigued in uh, the, the subject of the relationship between population growth and availability of resources, then I urge you to read the paper that IEA has just uh, published. But again, um, this is a background presentation to the paper. That is how it should be perceived. So with that, let me see if I can share my screen. 
Yes, I succeeded in doing that. Okay. Is the presentation being seen by everyone? Yes, okay, very good. So over the next 20 minutes, I would like to uh, provide an update on the relationship between resource abundance and uh, population growth by introducing the concept of uh, uh, time price, price elasticity of population, and proposing the Simon Abundance Index as a new way of measuring the abundance or availability of resources. So it will be a four-part presentation. Um, 50 years ago, a Stanford University biologist, uh, prof biology professor, Professor Paul Ehrlich, uh, published a highly influential book called The Population Bomb. The early editions included uh, the now infamous statement, the battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. Ehrlich, who is still alive, believes that population growth and the concomitant rise in consumption must, must lead to an environmental collapse, exhaustion of natural resources, food shortages, and mass starvation. Just recently, he noted that you can't go on growing forever on, an, on a finite planet. The biggest problem we face is the continued expansion of human enterprise. Perpetual growth is the creed of a cancer cell. So according to Ehrlich, population controls, including coerced sterilization and financial penalties for excessive birth rate, and consumption limits in rich countries are needed in order to prevent a catastrophe. The late University of Maryland economist, Julian Simon, rejected Ehrlich's thesis. He believed that there is no physical or economic reason why human resourcefulness and enterprise cannot forever continue to, re to respond to the impending shortages and existing problems with new expedients that, after an adjustment period, leave us better off than before the problem arose. In his 1981 book, The Ultimate Resource, Simon argued that humans were intelligent beings capable of innovating their way out of shortages through greater efficiency, increased supply, or development of substitutes. So to illustrate these two visions, Ehrlich believed that as population expands, that's the yellow arrow at the bottom of the chart, resources will grow scarcer, while Simon believed that as population expands, resources will grow more abundant. So after sparring with one another in print for most of the 1970s, Simon finally challenged Ehrlich to a wager. Ehrlich would choose any raw materials he wanted and a time period of more than a year, and Simon would, be, would bet on the inflation-adjusted prices decreasing rather than increasing. Ehrlich chose copper, chromium, nickel, and tungsten. Uh, the bet was agreed on September 1980, with September uh, 1990 being the payoff date. In spite of a population increase of 873 million over those 10 years, Ehrlich lost the wager. All five commodities that he selected declined in price by an average of 57.6%. So Ehrlich mailed Simon a check for $576.07. Since Simon won his bet with Ehrlich, Ehrlich's supporters have argued that Simon got lucky. 
Had his bet with Ehrlich taken place over a different decade, the outcome might have been different. Indeed, some economists who ran simulations for every 10-year period between 1900 and 2008 found that Ehrlich got the better of Simon most of the time. Now, I believe that the conditions of the Simon Ehrlich wager were too generous to the doomsayers because Simon only looked at the real price of resources and did not account for income growth, which tend to increase at a faster pace than inflation. It is important to remember that things can get cheaper in two different ways. The price can go down and or the buyer's income can go up. Put differently, what matters for ordinary human beings is not the real price of resources, but the real price of resources relative to the amount of labor that's required to purchase those resources. Or, Adam, or as Adam Smith put it, the real price of everything is the toil and trouble of acquiring it. What is bought with money is purchased with labor. So to update the Simon Ehrlich wager, Gail Pooley, my co-author and I, started by uh, pulling historical commodity price data from the World Bank and the IMF going all the way back to 1980, which is uh, when the original wager started. And it is crucial to note here that we did not select or cherry pick the commodities in question. We simply took what uh, the two organizations had on offer and we ended up with 50 commodities uh, with uh, each weighted equally in our calculations. So, what did we find? Well, the nominal price of commodities, of these 50 commodities, increased by 62.7%. But inflation increased by 155.6%. So the real price of commodities fell by 36%. The real income per person per year rose by 63%, uh, but annual hours worked fell by almost 10%, and therefore the real hourly income rose by 80%. Um, so with the real income per person per year rising by 63%, uh, sorry, anyway, the time price uh, equals the real price divided by hourly income. And therefore, the time price of commodities fell by 64.7%. And this is just a different way of uh, showing what I was talking about. If you just look at the prices of 50 commodities, um, nominal prices, you see that they have increased substantially. Once you account for inflation, uh, you realize that the prices are much lower. Once you account for an increase in income, which is to say, once you realize that in addition to the price of resources, you have to account for how much more money people are making, and you convert the real prices into time prices, uh, the amount of time that it takes to, uh, um, to, to earn something, then you end up with time prices of resources um, declining substantially. Um, here is a more detailed look at the change in price commodities, price of commodities between 1980 and 2017. And as can be seen here, the time price of all commodities fell. Uranium fell the most, almost 85% and zinc the least, almost 18%. But on average, the time price of 50 commodities fell by 67, 64.7%. Okay, so what does that mean in practice? 
the time it took to earn enough money to buy one unit in our basket in uh, uh, 1980 would have bought 2.83 units or baskets in 2017. In other words, the commodities that took 60 minutes of work to buy in 1980 took only 21 minutes of time in 2017. In the context of the Simon Ehrlich wager, the two different variables um, are resource availability and population growth. The price elasticity of population quantifies the relationship between population growth and resource availability. In Simon's telling, commodities growth because commodities grow more plentiful, not in spite of population growth, but because of it. With every hungry mouth comes a brain capable of reason and innovation. Was he correct? The price elasticity of population, or PEP, can help us answer that question. In economics, elasticity is a measure of a variable's sensitivity to a change in another variable. In our case, the two variables are percentage changes in time price and world's population. So, between 1980 and 2017, the time price of our basket of commodities declined by 63.7%. You saw that in the previous slide. Over the same time period, the world's population increased by 4.5%. Four, six billion, from 4.46 billion to 7.55 billion. So that's a 63% increase. So once we divide the decline in uh, price of commodities by, um, the, by the change in uh, the number of people who live on Earth, this is what we come up with. So what does that mean in practice? Well, it means that for each 1% increase in world's population, the time price of 50 commodities declined by 0.934%. So as noted, people often assume that population growth leads to resource depletion. We found the opposite. Um, between 1980 and 2017, every individual human being who was born on our planet appears to have made resources proportionately more plentiful for the rest of us. The Simon Abundance Index, uh, which is published by uh, humanprogress.org, uh, measures the change in abundance of resources since uh, 1980. So the index represents the ratio of the change in population over the change in time price of commodities times 100. As previously mentioned, uh, population rose by 69% and prices declined by 64%. So that means that the Earth was 4.8 times as plentiful as, uh, 2000, in 2017 as it was when Ehrlich and Simon commenced their famous wager. And this is the, um, this is the Simon Abundance Index showing how much more plentiful in resources the world has become um, since 1980. So remember that uh, uh, the previous slide showed an index, uh, which means that uh, the value stands at uh, 479. So uh, anyway, my, uh, put differently, the Earth, uh, the, depending on how you look at it, uh, the Earth was uh, either 480% uh, more plentiful or 4.796 times as plentiful as it was in 1980. Um, so in conclusion, between 1980 and 2017, the time price of commodities fell by 65%. The price elasticity of population was uh, 0.9. And the Simon Abundance Index grew to 479%. Uh, percent, uh, in other words, the world was about four times as plentiful as it was in 1980. So in conclusion, the world 
its resources are finite in the same way that uh, a piano has a finite number of keys. Uh, the instrument can sound only 88 notes, but those can be played in an infinite variety of ways. Uh, the same applies to our planet. The Earth's atoms may be fixed, but human ingenuity can combine and recombine those atoms ad infinitum. Uh, what matters then is not the physical limits of our planet, but human freedom to experiment and reimagine the use of resources that we already have. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marion. I wonder whether I could ask you to uh, uh, stop sharing your screen and then we'll move okay. to the Q&A session. That's possible. Great, Excellent. thank you. Thank you. So, um, so let's now ask people uh, to uh, submit your questions. Um, uh, we've got about, uh, just, uh, just about uh, just over 35 minutes. So please feel free to submit those questions. Um, we've already had a first question, and, I've, and, I'll, and I'll follow up with a couple of questions on my own. Yeah, okay. So the first question really is just a very simple question, is where can you get hold of slides? There's a, um, a person who's attended who would like to get hold of the slides. So are they available publicly or? Of the slides? Yes, your, your presentation. Oh, oh uh, they're not, but I'm very happy to email it to the person who is asking. So. Uh, Email me at m2p at cato.org and I will send it to you. Great. Okay. The next uh, question coming in, also anonymous, is what are the implications for the resources curse? Oh, for the resource curse? Um, yeah. Well, the resource curse is slightly different, right? I mean, it's a concept relating to uh, the notion that if a country... Uh, has a lot of minerals, uh, the production of those minerals will uh, crowd out uh, other types of economic activity. Uh, it may increase the value of the domestic currency um, and, um, and, and so forth. Um, what are the implications? Well, I, I don't think there are, I cannot think of any immediate implications for the resource curse. However, if you look at the research uh, by uh, Andrew McAfee, um, his latest book, um, we are using fewer and fewer natural resources uh, and the countries like United Kingdom and the United States, which are, the, which are amongst the most highly um, developed economies, have already reached the peak of resource use and are, are now on the way down. This is not a, um, uh, this, is not to, this is not a relative use of resources. This is an absolute use of resources. So even when British and American economies are running hot in the best of times, and we are producing two to 3% economic growth, we are using fewer resources than we have say 20 years ago. Now what that means is that resources are becoming less expensive relative, natural resources are becoming less expensive relative to the human resource, to human capital. Uh, increasingly, economic growth, productivity, uh, riches of society are being produced in here rather than in the mines. And this is something that that countries which rely on a lot of resources need to keep in mind that going to a mine and mining for cobalt or silver or whatever um, is losing its importance to producing a population that is intelligent, well-educated, has critical thinking, understanding of science, understanding of uh, uh, reason, logic, and also, crucially, a population which has the freedom to think, to exchange ideas, and to publish those ideas without being worried about being clamped down by some politically correct um, person. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, questions are now coming in. Um, next question from an anonymous attendee. Do you think fossil fuels will ever run out? No, in part because the Earth is 
still producing them. Um, I mean, uh, you know, as organisms die and uh, gravity uh, performs its magic, um, fossil fuels um, go on being produced. Um, the amount of reserves that we know of is continuing to increase. After 100 years of use and abuse of fossil fuels, we have more uh, of them than, uh, uh, we know of more of them than, than, than ever before. So no, I don't think so. I think that we are much more likely to transcend fossil fuels and embrace different types of energy rather than running out of anything. Okay, so please, uh, if the viewers at home, please keep the questions coming. Um, I've also got some questions which I'll hold in reserve in case we do run out. But um, let me uh, put the next two questions together because they're both related to the same thing. Um, we've got uh, Victoria Hewson, uh, also at the IA, who says, what are the implications for government programs that are desperately subsidizing renewables? Does it suggest green new deals are unnecessary? And a related question from Amara Adam says, possibly touching on this, uh, what do you believe the implications are for climate change and policy? Do you think the increase in resource abundance, according to the Simons Index, is a consequence of increased measures towards renewable energy, for example, or should less green economies keep going as they are? Um, I, I think I will need a little bit more explanation for the second question, but let me try to answer the first. Um, I do not believe that we currently have, well, let me put it differently. We have an energy source which is capable of powering the world without emitting any, almost any CO2 into the atmosphere. And it's, uh, it's nuclear. Uh, it's what the French uh, run on. And um, if we are serious about climate change and CO2 emissions and want to address it immediately uh, with the technology that we have, uh, we could go nuclear. Now, I understand that a lot of people are worried about nuclear, but in that case, I think our money would be much better spent trying to come up with nuclear technologies which are maybe smaller, more portable, uh, more safe, in other words, safer uh, nuclear reactors um, that maybe every city can have, um, smaller but safer. So I would, I would put a lot of money into that. And I actually think that the British government has put some money behind um, the, the fourth generation nuclear reactors as well as fusion. So nuclear reactors currently are fission. Fusion would be ideal because then you are not running the risk of, um, of, of uncontrolled uh, explosion and fusion is even safer. Uh, but of course we are not there yet. And so instead of spending trillions of dollars or trillions of pounds on building these extremely energy, um, energy intensive windmills um, and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and solar panels, which are useless when the sun, sun doesn't shine, I would put billions of dollars into research. Now, that doesn't mean that we couldn't run the world on fossil fuels. We are not going to run out of fossil fuels and they are probably going to become even cheaper as our technology of getting them out of the ground improves. But if indeed the society decides that we need to get away from fossil fuels, then I think the way forward is to go through extraordinarily safe um, fission or alternatively put serious money behind fusion reactors. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that's the way to go. Okay, if I could just make a request to people submitting questions, could we try and focus, if possible, on the topic that Marion talked about, the abundance of uh, natural resources and population growth? I will focus mostly on those questions. If you've asked an, uh, another question on Marion's personal views on zero carbon or fossil fuels, uh, we may well get to them, but I'll prioritize the ones on the, on the, actually, the, top, the topic of scarcity and, and abundance. And um, would, you be good enough, would you be good enough and rephrase the second question? Uh, let me just see if I can find it, sorry. Um, what, yes, I suppose you say, given your talk about the abundance of resources, 
What do you think are the implications for climate change policy? Do you think that the uh, relative increase in resource abundance, according to your index, is consequent? That, I'm going to read this out and let's see if we can understand it. Is consequent of increased measures towards renewable energy, for example? Or, oh, I see. So what they're saying is actually has the move towards greener, uh, you know, a more, more environmentally friendly um, policies meant that that's actually contributed to more abundance? if you like, um, and therefore, given that, should, uh, sh um, should less green economies, uh, you know, should, should, we, should economies uh, not necessarily less seek to go green, as it were? Um, I, I think it, it is a market, really. I mean, the, um, whether we mine one commodity or another will depend on the price. And so, um, you know, whether we are using natural gas or we are using uh, coal uh, or petroleum, uh, these things uh, very much depend on, on their relative price. And so um, um, the, so I, you know, if you, if you increase the price of gas or in, in British parlance, petrol, um, then uh, artificially uh, right now, something like out of every pound spent on, uh, on, on, on petrol in the United Kingdom, 80% of, of that goes to the government in taxes. Uh, so if you, increase the, um, if you increase the price of one commodity through artificial measures, and they may be justifiable, uh, then people are going to switch to something else like natural gas, um, which is, you know, a sort of intermediate fuel, um, before we find something else. So I think it's primarily driven by, by price uh, and, and to the effect that governments affect price, uh, then yes, uh, that, that could, could be contributing. Hey, I'm going to also uh, combine one of the questions with a question I had, which is, you know, one of the attendees says, what are the principal critics of this theory and your response, I know, of, 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 of your theory? And I, I was going to ask you in terms of critics, you know, um, they'll be saying, okay, you came up with this idea of real prices and time prices, but w are there critics out there who may use other calculations to actually show that prices have gone up? Um, so what, are your cri what would critics of your uh, numbers, you know, of, your, of your use of real prices or time prices say to show that you are wrong and to show that Ehrlich was right? Well, let's start with uh, the prices, the, the second point that you were making. Um, most of the literature, if not all, all, all of it, I mean, if there, if, if there is an, an original thought in this, in this paper and this thinking, it's the, it's the time price. Um, although whether it's original, you could debate that because Adam Smith already understood this principle. But, but most of the literature talks about real prices, okay? So if you can show that the real price of, say, um, zinc um, has increased over the last, 20 years or 50 years or whatever, uh, that could potentially be interpreted as zinc becoming uh, more scarce. Uh, and indeed, that is what you would see in, uh, when, when somebody is writing an article for Bloomberg or Wall Street Journal or The Guardian, you know. Um, we saw that not so long ago when petrol or, or rather crude oil was something like $120 and people started writing articles about us running out of, out of oil. What were they using? They were using real prices. They adjusted the price by inflation. Um, but in our view, um, what really matters to people is not what happens to real prices, but what happens vis-a-vis -vis the amount of time they have to spend working in order to afford something. So if, 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 if crude oil goes up in price by 100%, but your wages go up by 110%, then you are still better off. Um, and that is a side effect of, of, of something that we found, which that of all the resources uh, that we looked at, uh, the one that continuously increases in price is human labor, uh, which is to say that as our species uh, becomes more educated, smarter, more intelligent, and so forth, uh, we demand 
more money for our efforts. And that's not only true for uh, the species as a whole. I mean, obviously, we are much more productive than Neanderthals. Um, but it's also true of people during their lifetimes. Uh, people who are entering the job market obviously are able to command much less money than when they are just before the retirement. And the reason is that you acquire a lot of knowledge during your working life. So you can see it in your own life that as you become more productive, you are earning more money. Um, um, after all, you know, the Homo erectus had as many resources as we have today, uh, but they were desperately poor um, and we are very rich. Uh, what has changed? Uh, the human mind, knowledge uh, has changed, but the resources haven't. They've always been around. Um, the first question was, uh, remind me, uh, please. The um, first part. Sorry, it was just about the implications for climate change policy. Oh, um, the, the other thing, okay, the implication of climate change, okay, that's actually a very important question. Um, people who have abandoned uh, concern over us running out of stuff are now worried that it is in the process of getting the stuff out of the ground that we are despoiling so much of the environment that that could actually make the world uh, less environmentally sound, which is to say it's not necessarily that we are run, running out of everything, but all of this economic activity is producing so much pollution and so much environmental destruction that this cannot end well. That's the criticism, okay? The problem with that criticism, in my view, is that it assumes that you can only generate economic growth through bigness, more cars, more iron smelters, uh, more um, this, that, and the other. But you know what? You can also produce economic growth through making things smaller. So just like the computer, which used to fill an entire room, but is now in our pocket, in the same way, we can imagine a future where Let's, let's take a ridiculous example, ridiculous to us. If you can come up with teleportation, we will no longer need planes, we will no longer need cars, we will no longer need ships or anything like that. If you could come up with fusion, we will no longer ever need to produce more windmills or, uh, or uh, uh, panels or nuclear reactors. We could shut down every single coal-fired power plant and gas powered power plant in the world. My point is, economic growth can be generated by creating more stuff, in other words, going bigger, but it can also create, economic, economic growth can be created by making things smaller. And I think that this is where we are heading. Uh, the evidence is already accumulating there, and I urge you to read Andrew McAfee's new book, which basically shows that we have already reached and and, and, and past the peak of, uh, of, uh, of resource use. Great. Well, look, we've got about 20 minutes left, just under 20 minutes, and we've got about uh, five to seven questions to ask. And also what I didn't really do is do justice to that last question, because the other person, the other part of it was, what are the principal critiques of your theory or your treatment of the numbers, if you like? What, oh. you know, when you've presented this, what, what have been the criticisms from those who support the idea that actually stuff has become less abundant? Um, well, I haven't seen any criticism of uh, treating the prices in a time price ma manner. In other words, right. nobody has said yet uh, that this is the wrong way to go about it. Uh, that's number one. Number two, um, we cannot or shouldn't, we shouldn't really treat the environmental movement as a monolith. Um, there are different strands in it. There are a lot of smart environmentalists who understand that we are never going to run out of anything. Um, but, but, and, and, and our concerns about different environmental questions, about different environmental concerns. But 
that is not, unfortunately, the main view that you will see in um, newspapers and especially in TV and in the movies. So um, a lot of stuff that you see on TV and uh, in the cinema uh, still has that Malthusian undertone. We are going to run out of stuff. And um, that is indeed what a lot of people believe. And so even though parts of the environmentalist community have already embraced the Simonian view that we are not running out of things, that is not a popular perception. Uh, general public is still convinced that Malthusianism uh, and the early interpretation of Malthusianism is still relevant. And so it's always useful to push back against that. That's my view. But there is also another element to this, uh, before I go to the next question, if I may, which is that we may not be running out of stuff, but maybe we want to use uh, resources that are less, cause less damage to the environment, either in, a, either in their use or their extraction. So there is a variation on that, isn't, isn't there, to be fair? Um, yes, and that, that, that's really about the point that I was talking about before, uh, that it's the, it's the side effect of growth and, and uh, uh, getting to those resources, transporting of those resources, uh, using them and so forth. If, if you look at the uh, latest Michael Moore movie, uh, which almost got him <laughs> destroyed by, by the environmentalists. He basically comes to a very similar conclusion. Um, or rather, he comes... Uh, the, 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 the narrative in the movie is windmills and uh, solar panels are close to useless um, because they are actually, produ they actually produced in a very uh, resource-intensive way. Um, but it's, it's, it's the creation of, of these solar panels and, um, and windmills, as well as economic growth in general, which is producing a lot of environmental damage in terms of, uh, uh, you know, polluted rivers and so forth. Um, and, and, you know, toxic fumes in the atmosphere and so forth. And his answer, Michael Moore's answer, is that therefore we should have less economic growth and fewer people. So Michael Moore comes to the Malthusian conclusion, fewer people using fewer resources, but he gets there through the uh, side effect of economic growth and environmental destruction rather than running out of resources. So it's, it's really a, it's really a, 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 an, an improved, or if you will, a finessed version of the early uh, Malth Malthus um, uh, view, but it's not exactly the same. And my argument to that, uh, to Michael Moore, would be that, um, first of all, uh, putting measures in place, limiting women's ability to have more children is immoral, um, and it shouldn't be done. Every woman should be able to choose however many babies she wants to have. Um, so that's point number one. Um, and, and point number two would be that I don't think it, that limitation of consumption is something that is, uh, that is at all realistic. I think that people um, want to improve their lives and those of their families, and they want to consume more. So we have to look, uh, we have to tackle this problem uh, from a different perspective. And uh, I, I think that um, part, of, part of the answer rests in societies becoming richer and having more money to protect their environment. Let's look at Britain. Uh, Britain almost ran out of trees during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, now the British Isles have as many trees as there were before the Industrial Revolution during the medieval period. How did that happen? Well, it happened because British society is now so rich that it can spend a lot of money on environmental uh, upgrade, or, you know, uh, investing more in the environment. Um, so that's, that's, that, that brings up the subject of environmental Kuznets curve, which we can talk about later. Okay, now we've got about uh, just over 10 minutes. Um, we've got quite a few questions. So if I can ask viewers uh, to go into the Q&A function, help me out by um, 
by um, vote, voting for them, then that could that would help me uh, that will help me choose the questions. So next question is from and it's oh it's changing all the time. It's rather dynamic league table here. So next question is from Amara Adam. I says, hold on a minute, no, no, Robert Roberto White. So I'm I'm going to I'm going to answer uh, Robert, uh, Roberto White's question. Ask Roberto White. This is um, you, I think you mentioned this uh, in your in your talk. What you know, what do you think about people who say uh, that they don't wish to have children because of the fear of what the planet will be like in terms of resources in the future? Oh, I think I think it's insane. I, I think it's it's I I, I I I was trying to keep it as objective as possible, but one cannot be objective. Well, you, why don't you say you disagree? How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's 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 a, it's a terrible notion um, for two reasons. One, uh, it's almost certain that at the end of this century, we are going to have fewer people than at the peak in the 2060s. So the, the population continues to increase, but total fertility rates are dropping at such a fast level that uh, uh, at the end of this century, we are probably going to have as many people, or around the same amount of people as we have today. Uh, the second reason why, um, uh, why it's a bad idea is because human beings are the generators of ideas and ideas lead to progress. In other words, uh, unless we are going to have some sort of a supercomputer, artificial intelligence, which is going to create, um, um, uh, which is going to create the new Mozart music or which is going to find a cure for uh, the, new pan the, the next pandemic, we have to rely on people to come up with answers to our most pressing problems. The more people we have, the more ideas we have, the more we can interact with, uh, the more they can interact with those ideas. In the words of Matt Ridley, ideas having sex, until you come up with a solution to our problems. So far, all of our problems have been solved by people. If you don't have people, then um, I guess no problem. <laughs> Great. So look, we've got just over uh, uh, five minutes left, uh, probably about seven minutes for questions. Uh, we've got about six questions. So why don't we see if we can get through, say, four of them if possible. Um, Amara Adam asks, does the measure, uh, so going back to the numbers, consider an unequal distribution? Does this growing population benefit from the rise in resource abundance or are we simply extracting from them? Um, it doesn't produce any kind of... Um uh, specific adjustment for inequality, but what it does do is to look at 50 most basic commodities that uh, uh, are most important to the people at the bottom of the economic uh, ladder. I mean, we are not uh, measuring um, Lamborghinis or yachts or things like that, which rich people buy. We are looking at things like uh, chicken and uh, and, uh, and 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 heating oils and um, stuff that ordinary people, especially poor people, need in order to um, have better lives. So in, in that sense, if, if the index is skewed in any way, it is skewed pro-poor rather than pro-rich. Okay, next question. Uh, once again, we're, we're getting back to the numbers. Uh, do you think Ehrlich chose the wrong commodities to bet on? For example, if you bet on lithium today, it would probably go up given the demand for batteries on all aspects of our lives. Ah, you would think that, but not necessarily, um, because um, right now we are relying on lithium for batteries, but tomorrow some genius in Silicon Valley or in London can come up with a completely different battery uh, that will make uh, lithium obsolete. We have absolutely no idea what, we'll, what, what we will be needing in the future. Uh, lithium may be all the rage now, but uh, you know people are going to become better at extracting it, People are going to create substitutes, very important, uh, if the price goes, uh, goes high. And so uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, if you're going to bet, depends on your timeline, but if you're going to bet 50 years from now, I would bet for commodities being cheaper rather than, rather than more expensive, including lithium. Okay, um, we've, got, we've, got, we've got time for uh, a couple more questions, I think. So Alexander Hammond, I'm sure you know him. Is, yes. uh, Hi, Marion. Big fan. So a bit of mutual, uh, 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 mutual respect or mutual admiration here. Your calculations show that the reason that the uh, time price of goods has increased and thus goods have become cheaper is because of increase in incomes that have occurred since the 1980s. 
Now, if you change the time series so that you just looked at the last 10 or 20 years, say comparing 2000 and, 20, and 2020, for example, where there's been greater income stagnation, would you find the prices of goods actually increasing? So that's a very good question, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a suggestion for a research project because so far we, what we've been doing is going back in time rather than forward. So um, what we have done, um, you can look at it online, but also I'm writing a book as we speak, and we go all the way back to 1850. So the standard procedure, what you want to do when looking at prices and incomes is to look over as long a period of time as you possibly can. Because if you are estimating human progress, you, you really want to look at data from, uh, from a long period of time. So in this book that I'm writing right now, we are looking 1850 to 2020 or 2018. Um, and, um, but, but, uh, but if you are looking at the last 10 years, I haven't done that, uh, partly because well, partly because I think that uh, longer time periods show uh, a, a well, because you you wanna you wanna keep on discovering uh, new information about the relationship of, be, between population growth and resources and the long term availability of resources. You don't want to just focus on a ten year period and say, okay, because the economy was doing so badly. Um, you know, people have, uh, people are poorer now than they were. That's undoubtedly true, but that's only, a, that, that, that's a secondary issue to the relationship between population and resources, which is the primary objective of the project. Let's see if we can squeeze in a couple. Uh, Vedant Sinha says, is a combination of technological progress and knowledge dissemination the only way to maintain resource abundance in the face of rising population? Is this combination any different to the Industrial Revolution that facilitated Britain's escape from the Malthusian trap? Um, is it different? Combination of technological progress and knowledge dissemination. Okay. Uh, um, no, it's not. Um, because let's go back to Mokier's distinction between Smithian growth and uh, Schumpeterian growth. So before the Industrial Revolution, uh, we were really dealing with Smithian growth. You were trying to bring more people into the economy, more capital, more land, and so on and so forth. Um, and, but, but, you know, the economy was improving at a slow pace. Um, with Industrial Revolution and Schumpeterian growth, which is the application of ideas, we are no longer growing like this, we are growing like this. In other words, Schumpeterian growth is order of the magnitude um, um, faster than Smithian growth uh, because it's based on ideas, not just adding more human beings into the global economy. If we didn't have any new ideas and we added China and India into the global economy, there would be some growth. But if those Chinese and Indians can produce use new ideas, then you can accelerate the pace of growth. And, and that's where we are living now. And I think that's probably the type of uh, economic thinking that started in Britain during the Industrial Revolution. Okay, let's see if we can squeeze in one last question. Uh, Linda Whetstone, who I'm sure you, you know very well, who's an IEA trustee and, do, uh, and, a, and, a, and a hero to many of us in the classical liberal movement. I'm sure she's blushing now with her modesty. Um, if an, and Linda asks, if, if the number of good ideas is related to the numbers of people on the planet, do you really think that as the population reduces in the future, the beneficial processes you've been discussing will reverse? Well, uh, population numbers are only useful, or more people are only useful if they function within freedom. Um, um, if people cannot think, uh, converse, um, write and, and, uh, and apply their ideas, um, then uh, increased numbers of people are not that beneficial. Um, if, if you cannot open a business um, and apply your, your, your idea, or if you cannot even think about it or write about it, then, uh, then, uh, then no. So, so, so it's, it's really humans time, times times freedom that produce the ideas which then lead to prosperity. Um, 
do I think that um, the process could go into reverse? I can imagine a situation, uh, let's put artificial intelligence aside and um, um, let's just focus, let's just imagine that it's all about people and freedom. I can certainly imagine that at some point in the future, you could have so few people in the world that, um, um, that you wouldn't be able to produce new ideas um, at the pace that you currently can. I mean, Matt Ridley described the number of cases when humanity's knowledge base has actually shrunk and knowledge has retreated and people became more technologically primitive. The example of Tasmania is, is a very good one. After the Tasmanians got stranded in Tasmania uh, by the rising oceans, uh, there were so few of them that they, they, they actually lost some technological knowledge. Now, 100 years in the future, uh, or even 50 years in the future, it's possible that we will all have all of human information on a microchip in our heads. In other words, we will never again lose uh, information in the way that we have done during the dark ages after the fall of Rome or Tasmanians uh, in, in Australia. Um, but even if we maintain the entire stock of human knowledge, you, will, you could still have too few people to interact with that knowledge critique each other's ideas um, and therefore harm economic growth in the long run. Yes, so there could be some retardation of growth rather than reversal. Oh gosh, what, what, what a pessimistic note to end on. I was rather hoping that would end on an optimistic note, but it doesn't matter because overall you, your, your message has been optimistic, Marion, that, you know, that we are not running out of resources as much as people think. There's more abundance than we believe that we should be relying on technological progress, exchange of ideas and innovation. Uh, Dr. Marion Tupi, thank you very much for joining us today. Can I also thank the viewers? I hope you found it as fascinating as I did. Um, we do have a regular schedule of online content, so please do check, out, check that out on ia.org.uk. If you're a classically liberal-minded PhD, PhD student and you'd like to know more about our programme of seminars with the Vincent Centre University of Buckingham, please get in touch. Um, tomorrow, we'll be releasing our latest IEA COVID-19 briefing paper, Chinese Puzzle, a classical liberal approach to post-pandemic relations with China. So please look out for that. That will be available on our website and elsewhere. Our next academic webinar on August the 19th will be joined by Frederick Erickson to discuss his latest publication on to uh, uh, Towards an Ideas-Based Globalization. Uh, ties in very much with what uh, Mariam was talking about today. For more details of our online content, please visit our website, ia.org.uk, subscribe to our YouTube channel, IA London, or listen to our podcasts on Podbean. And if I could just end on this to help us keep providing free content during these tough times, please do consider making a contribution, no matter how modest, by donating online at ia.org.uk slash donate hyphen now. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for watching or listening today. I hope you'll be able to join us again soon. Thank you very much, uh, Marion, for joining us today. Uh, can I wish all of you, um, I hope that you can stay safe and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.